I was 13 years old, so I had just finished middle school, and my parents thought it'd be a good idea for me to go out and spend the summer with my uncle. That's Mike Lavanino. He's now almost 60, but he still remembers the summer he spent in the mountains with his uncle Rima. Uh, he was really, really cool. He was the uncle that uh, every kid wanted and no parent kind of wanted to have. Um, <laughs> he would give you all the things an uncle should give you. I mean, for one of my Christmases, he gave me a gerbil. Uh, he always gave us water guns and water balloons and everything your father or your mother really doesn't want flying around the house. They spent the summer of 1974 crisscrossing Colorado in a Bronco. We would go over some of the passes, uh, Mosquito Pass, I can remember vividly. We also went out looking for mushrooms quite often. Um, it was a great mushroom year. He used to dry mushrooms that were Italian, so we used to use them in spaghetti sauce and things like that. So we were always in the Bronco. In 1995, Uncle Remo died. It was a heart attack, sudden and unexpected. Mike went to Colorado to help settle the estate, and that's when he saw the Bronco sitting in his uncle's driveway. He never got rid of it. He kept it running, even though it was in rough shape. I mean, by that time, it was 25 years old, had 80-some thousand miles, rough miles on it. They were thinking about ways to get rid of it and to sell it, and I told them I would take it. And so he did. In June of the next year, Mike drove it from his uncle's place in Aspen to his home on the East Coast. The seat had collapsed, the, the bench seat. There was a boat cushion in there. I had to get another boat cushion to get it up high enough to where I could actually see out of it and actually have some comfort, and then started driving it back all the way to Virginia. Just to be clear, officially, Ford does not endorse the idea of modifying your vehicle with boat cushions. But hey, whatever floats your Bronco. He parked it out back of his house, promising himself he'd find time to fix it up. But you know, life has a way of getting in the way of things. No, it sat outside for a while, unfortunately. It took some weathering and a little bit of rust. The floorboards were pretty much gone anyway. I mean, they didn't get any worse than what it was, but it sure didn't get any better. Then in 2017, Mike retired. That was always my goal was to restore the vehicle. I needed something to do once I retired to keep out of my... Uh, wife's hair. It was a little later than planned, but he finally started the restoration, and now, three years later, it's almost done. Probably, I'd say 98%. It's been upgraded quite a bit as far as the engine goes. It's gone up from a 3, 302 to a 351. The original color was Cordova. I have changed it to Daytona Sunset Orange. Despite the changes, Mike says this will always be Uncle Remo's Bronco. And if you look at the speedometer, it actually says on the speedometer, Remo's 69. So, yes, I think about him quite a bit and what he would have thought of it and how I think he would have loved it. I think he would really like the direction that I took it. Mike's story is the perfect metaphor for the rise, fall, and rebirth of the Bronco. It started in the late 60s, it had a rebellious and wild youth, and it died in the mid-90s. And now, it's being brought back to life. In fact, and I don't blame you if you don't believe me because the coincidence is really eerie, but the day that Mike got Uncle Remo's Bronco to Virginia and parked it out back, that was June 12th, 1996. The exact day that the last Bronco rolled off the line at the Wayne Assembly plant in Michigan. I never understood why they decided to get rid of that and lose that Bronco name that it had developed for itself over the years. I've never understood that either. So that's where this series is going to start with that question. Why did Ford kill the Bronco? Was it poor sales, competition from other brands? Was it the questions about rollover accidents that plagued the Bronco too? Or was it the damage done when millions of people watched a white Bronco carry a man accused of murder running from the police on national television? Lightning fast and bizarre developments tonight in the O.J. Simpson story. We're seeing live pictures right now. The football hero believed to be a passenger in that Ford Bronco. 
I'm Sonari Glinton, and this is Bring Back Bronco, the untold story. Now, just as Mike's story parallels the rise, fall, and rebirth of the Bronco brand, the broader story of the Bronco parallels a lot of what's happening in America. Economics, culture, politics. And yes, in case you were wondering, we will definitely dig into the story of the slow white Bronco chase. But we're going to look at it from Ford's point of view, how they saw it and how they reacted. But as much as I love history, let's start with something new. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to finally announce that we are bringing back the Ford Bronco in 2020. That's from the North American International Auto Show in Detroit. And yep, the Bronco is back. This is a no compromise midsize 4x4 utility for the thrill seekers who want freedom and off-road functionality with the space and versatility of an SUV. But we've got a long way to go before we get there. A bit about me. When it comes to the car business, I'm a bit of an insider and an outsider. You see, my grandfather came to Detroit from the South in the 40s, like millions of African Americans looking for a better life, and he found it working for General Motors. My mother was one of the first female foremen at Ford. They call them supervisors now. She worked at Ford's Chicago assembly plant, and she got me a job on the assembly line there when I was in college. But I'm also a journalist, and I was an economics reporter for NPR and Planet Money, and I've covered the auto industry for most of my adult life. But enough about me. Let's talk Bronco. Chapter 1, The American Dream. The first step to solving the mystery of why Ford killed it is understanding the history of the Bronco. So let's go back to his birth and the world it was born into. In the late 50s and early 60s, life was good in the auto industry. And as a result, the whole city of Detroit was in the middle of a post-war boom. For car makers, there were very few restraints. You know, willing bosses, money to burn, a whole, whole lot of ego. The only question was, what kind of vehicle do you make when you can make almost anything? Well, let me just set the scene a bit. Now, we've gone from a time when there was about 160 small car companies spread around the country to a time when there were only about seven or eight really large ones. Ford Motor Company had just completed construction on this glorious new headquarters. It's a 13-story office building, what a lot of people would call mid-century modern, sleek, imposing, infinitely functional. It represents America at its most powerful. Bailey Sasoy Moore is a Detroit history expert, and she's standing with me in another Ford building looking at it. Welcome to Detroit. So you're in Dearborn, just a couple of miles outside of the city of Detroit. In fact, just slightly in front of us, you've got world headquarters of the Glass House. So to me, that's peak Detroit. You know, 1950s America, you couldn't talk about major companies without Ford being part of that conversation. In fact, Lincoln is producing presidential limos throughout the 1950s and 60s. What's more Americana than you being the company that's producing the president's car? We're talking about Detroit because, well, this is where the Bronco was born. In fact, at the time, Detroit was the auto industry and vice versa. The population of suburban Detroit is hovering around 4 million people. And according to a 1958 study, one out of every three people worked directly for one of the automobile companies in Detroit. Not, not ancillary, not that. Oh, not I, ancillary. If you're willing to go into like the tertiaries, like you work for a supplier, you work for the diner across the street that serves the lunches, then we're talking more than half of the population of the city of Detroit and the metro areas is employed or tertiarily employed by the automobile companies. That's a rock number. That is a number so big that if a meteor had hit Detroit in 1954, automobile production on the global scale would not have recovered. A meteor is really the only thing car executives had to worry about at the time. The rest of their job was as good as it gets. Um, executives are making some of the highest pay they've ever made. Guys on the line, like standard you and me guys, are making more than they could ever make. Yeah, so life was good. 
You're pre-Vietnam War. Motown records are going nuts. We haven't had the gas embargo. So if you did get that car, that dream car, you could go to this brand new thing sweeping the country, a McDonald's drive through get two cheeseburgers, a fry, and a Coke, turn on your Motown radio, listen to the Marvelettes Please Mr. Postman, and in every way kind of live that American dream. I kind of think of myself as a bit of a detective. You know, I'm looking for clues about why Ford stopped making the Broncos in the 90s. And lucky for me, Ford has left behind a lot of them. You see, as a company, Ford is a bit of a hoarder. They've saved millions of pieces of paper, communications, and records from the last 100 years. And it's all under the care of one man, Ted Ryan. Tell me where we're at. You are in the archives of the Ford Motor Company. That's Ted, Ford's archivist, and this is kind of Ford's attic. Everything from handwritten memos, sketches, ads, photos, artifacts, and literally miles of documents are right here. Just a second. Oh, let's, all right, let's go. Let me get my tea. Okay, sure. Actually, you know what? If you want your tea, drink it here. No, can't take it in there. Can't take it in there. All right, I'm gonna... I may have a habit of spilling tea. I just don't want to do it in this climate-controlled room. We have 16,000 cubic feet of material that are stored on three miles of shelving. So if you took every shelf and you laid them end to end, it would stretch from here to uh, downtown just about. We have three specialized uh, freezer vaults for negatives, uh, for film, and for videotape for the long-term preservation. The stuff that I'm looking at is mostly mid-century paperwork and photos. The beginning is actually during World War II. During World War II, Ford Motor Company built more than 270,000 Jeeps. After the war, Ford began to build what were called the Mutt. And here we have a couple of pictures. One is of Jeeps, and the other is of the Mutt, which looks very similar to a Jeep. They look identical. It's obvious the Mutt was built to appeal to veterans looking for something familiar. The, it was a piece of home, a piece of the war. So as the, the generation that fought World War II, as they grew older, they went back and they bought these Jeeps. So Ford realizes there is a gap in the market that we know that we can fill that is unique and nobody else is doing it. No, no, what, 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 what is that gap? The International Harvester Scout, uh, bumpy, uh, off-road vehicle, uh, the Willis Jeep, once again, the, the direct descendant of the original Jeep. They are off-road vehicles, but they're not on-road vehicles, and they don't have any creature comforts. Essentially, that same Jeep that Patton was in, that's what Willis is making in 1960. And if you want to go off-roading, you're bumping around and you have zero creature comforts. Every great product starts with a problem that needs solving. And this was the problem. We wanted to build a car, uh, a, a vehicle that you could take on the highway and go down to, to Malibu, but you could also then get, go off-roading and go up wherever you wanted to go. So it had to do both. The automobile industry is different from many other industries and in that you have to anticipate trends three years out. So we, well, we didn't really... Three years out, man. Come on, you got to be... Yeah. <laughs> that market research report, that is the market research that identified the gap in the market. Oh, and so hold so, on. This is, this, is, uh, this is what tells you why... This, this is, is what tells us the utility vehicle buying public like utility vehicles, but they like their comfort too. What can we do to help fill this gap? Can we also be a leader in this new market? All right, the thing that jumps out for me from all of this paperwork is the name. Our early documents, they called it the GOAT. Goes over all-terrain vehicle. Yep, you heard that right. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the all-new Ford GOAT. My favorite documents that I found are two from October 63, where they very specifically called out the GOAT. Goes over all-terrain. And that was the guiding principle. So every project has to have a North Star. So in this particular case, the North Star was a goat. Now, they had to figure out what it would look like. Some of the drawings that we have here, this is the very first one, and it's done by M. Thompson. M.W. Thompson Jr. Uh, Mac Thompson, he was the first African-American uh, automobile designer in Detroit. And he came to work at Ford. And he was the one that sketched out the original sketches. Like, this, is, this is blowing my mind. Well, I always, yeah, always caution. A lot of people yeah, worked on it, but he, he penned the sketch. But that, 
a brother was there at the beginning makes me proud. And like that this is his, uh, honest to God, the goat, as drawn by Mac Thompson, was pretty bare bones. If Ford was looking for the sweet spot between rugged and comfortable, this definitely leaned more to the rugged side. I guess the best way to put it is, it definitely lived up to the name. <laughs> okay, about that name. The overriding sentiment was, well, if you build it, people will buy it. But would people really buy a goat? Internally, Ford started considering a few other options. There was the Bravo, the Rustler, the Caballero, my favorite, uh, the Trailblazer, and eventually they settled on the Bronco. And it was just one decision in a process that had thousands of them. But just imagine if they had gotten that one wrong. At the top of the show, I mentioned how I see a lot of parallels between the rise and fall of the Bronco and that of the whole country. Well, you can also connect the dots between the truck and the city of Detroit. In the summer of 1963, on a blistering hot Sunday afternoon, the Reverend Martin Luther King stood at a podium and addressed the crowd before him. And so this afternoon, I have a dream. That one it was a very big moment for all of America, a turning point in our collective history. And my four little children will not come up in the same young days that I came up within, but they will be judged on the basis of the content of their character, not the color of their skin. You've probably studied that speech in school. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream. But here's something you may not know. That audio that you just heard, those famous words that changed our country, well, that's not from August 28th, 1963. That he's not at the Lincoln Memorial. In fact, he's not even in Washington, D.C. No, that speech, it's from June of 63, and he's standing on stage at Cobo Hall. Yeah, the I Have a Dream speech that changed America was first delivered in Detroit. Free at last! Free at last! Now, what does all of that have to do with the Ford Bronco? <laughs> well, two things. For one, even if you think you know a lot about something, you probably don't know everything. And this podcast is about to tell you a whole bunch of things you definitely don't know about the Bronco. And two, it's a reminder that in the middle of the last century, the 50s and the 60s, Detroit is where everything is happening. It was the site of the first successful open heart surgery. It was the home of the Northland Center, one of the first and largest malls in the world. No matter what measuring stick you choose, medical, commercial, industrial, musical, Detroit came out on top. And that, my friends, is the world that gave us the Bronco. In January 1965, three prototypes were built for testing. When you take a, a prototype like the Bronco uh, out, you're, you're going to take it out and test it in conditions that really mimic where you think it's going to be used. That's Todd Zercher. If anyone can shed light on why the Bronco was shelved, it's him. He's the guy who literally wrote the book on the Bronco. His 191-page, full-color, hardcover book is on the shelf of every serious Bronco collector. They call the Arizona Proving Grounds the birthplace of the Bronco because they did so much development and testing of the Broncos. There's stuff you, you just, you know, you can do so much driving around a test track in, in Dearborn, Michigan. So on this trip, of course, they had Broncos, and they brought an international scout, and they bought a, brought a CJ5, which were the two prime competitors. They were driving out in the, the wild country out there. In, in northwest Arizona, there's a lot of steep climbs. There's a lot of steep descents. And then the other thing that can be tricky is there's a lot of the roads are on side hills. And so your, your vehicle's leaning over to the side. It might be a 25, 30, or graded degree slope. And there you're checking, you know, okay, is it is this thing going to roll over? Is it going to get tippy? One by one, they drove across the face of the hill. At some point, the scout rolled over and rolled down this hill. Paul Axelrad, the chief engineer on the project, was one of the drivers. 
one guy broke his collarbone, uh, another person fractured their hip and broke his right arm. Axelrad was in the vehicle that rolled over. He was the passenger and the driver, who was an engineer from Germany, at some point looked over. Axelrad had maybe been knocked unconscious or something. And, and this German guy said in his very thick German accent, he said, Paul, are you still with us? Like, are you still alive kind of a thing? I, I've kind of chuckled about that over the years. I just find it ironic that the chief engineer was the one that was injured in this. It's like, you know, taking the CEO of the company out to test something and, oh, great, the president's the one that breaks his arm when you're on the trip. You know, it's, it's you know I, I mean, come on. I, I, uh, let, 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 let's be real. I kind of wish that uh, all, you know, all car executives had to do that. You go do the, you right, go do the right, testing. Yeah. You wanted it. You go check it. You you do it yourself. <laughs> the other reason this is one of Todd's favorite stories is a little detail that every Bronco driver already knows and appreciates. By providing extra stability on roads and steep grades and good training. In the Broncos advertising over the years, they they always made a big deal about the Bronco was a little bit wider than the Scout and the CJ5. And so... If you think about if you're traversing a, a side hill like that and you and you don't want to tip over, you want as wide a vehicle as you can. And so the Bronco is a little bit wider, hence it's a little more safe on those slopes than its competition. And so they kind of proved that. Now it's just a couple of inches on the frame, but hey, details matter. Listening better, building better. That's Ford. But they would look at all the different elements. Now, bragging about its horizontal stability appeals to the hardcore off-roaders, but most of the marketing material in Ted's archives speaks to the culture of the Bronco. I, oh my God, this is so amazing. This is what the mock-up of an advertisement would be. Yes. And it, it's going in Automotive News, August 16th, 1965, and this is the ad that's going in Automotive News. Which is five days after the launch. So this is, essentially, this is your launch ad. And it gives all the details on the car. Um, so when you look in the archives, have you seen how they're trying to brand this vehicle? How, what are they thinking about who the folks are? Definitely. And it's an interesting, that's a really good question because it's an interesting story. The Mustang comes out in April of 1964. And the Mustang creates the pony class of sports car. Small, sporty, stylish. We sell a million of them in the first two years. One of the most popular car launches of all time. Look, you cannot overstate it. The Mustang was a monster hit in terms of sales and as a cultural icon, and Ford wanted to build on that very hot success. The new Ford Bronco for 1966. A rough, tough, go-anywhere, climb-anything sports car. So as they are developing the Bronco, the, the Mustang is the sport pony, and the Bronco is going to be the sport utility pony. That phrase, sport utility pony, often got replaced with Sport Utility Vehicle. And that was the founding of an acronym, SUV, that now describes more than half, well more than half, of the vehicles being produced in America. And the term SUV has morphed over time. Now we think of it as suburban utility vehicle. But, you know, when Ford coined that term in 1965, it was sports. It was uh, go anywhere, do anything. The original ads, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll say in here, Bronco is excitingly different, a new breed of car of those who seek adventure as well as practical transportation. You know how you have that little black dress and depending on what necklace you add or what shoes you wear, you can change from Thursday afternoon staff meeting to Friday night dinner date? Well, the same thing for the first generation Bronco. Accessories were everything. It basically, it came as a plain vehicle, but you could add a winch, you could add a snowplow, you could add anything that you needed to make it, to turn it into a work vehicle. Or if you're an off-roader, you could add a kayak rack and you could do this. See, but, and then you get all you of get the colors. It's like almost like a Pantone, yeah. like of all of these colors. You can get a Bronco in all of these colors. Yeah, so here's your color palette for Bronco. Deep blue met, green fire, walnut fire, Grabber yellow. Naming colors is the sport of kings, one of the marketers once told me. Seafoam green. Rangoon red. Peacock blue. Those are yeah. good. That's a good... Um, 
But the colors, once again, they express your personality. The first Broncos arrived on dealership lots August 11th, 1965. The sticker price for a base model was $2,300. And after three years of testing, designing, and marketing, the question was, would anyone buy one? So they introduced the Bronco, and the Bronco in its first year sold over 20,000 units. 23,776 to be exact. Yeah, compared to a lot of other cars, the Bronco, you know, if you're looking at sheer sales numbers, it's it's not huge. Oh, more than not huge, it's barely a blip, especially when you compare it to Ford's other pony car. They sold the same number of Mustangs on the first day it was introduced as the whole first year they did of Bronco. The sales numbers were disappointing, but the Bronco was a new type of vehicle. They knew it was going to have to climb uphill. Now, what they needed were some real drivers to showcase it in extreme conditions. And one of those drivers was James Duff. Today, James Duff is 80 and lives in Knoxville, Tennessee. 53 years ago, he was just down the road from where I am right now. In 67, I was living in West LA, working in a body shop at a Ford dealership. And when the Bronco came out, they were pretty anemic looking with their little five inch wide wheels. Anemic looking or not, he bought one. I decided to immediately to drive it from California to Nova Scotia on a cross country trip. Uh, that's where I learned all the shortcomings of a Bronco and then decided to tear it all apart and make it into a Baja racer. The Baja 1000 was the hot new thing in auto racing. Baja is the Baja Peninsula, south of Southern California, which is probably the roughest terrain you'll find anywhere. It's a grueling 1,000-mile race nonstop through the Mexican desert. I believe in 69, I think it was probably 300 cars entered into it, and you might get 10 cars per class finish the race. James's first year, he was one of the ones who didn't finish. There was a hay truck coming down the middle of the highway. Oh yeah, they don't close the roads for this race. School buses, motorcycles, and farm equipment are all a part of the action. So you had to duck and get around a hay truck, and we went end over end, uh, probably about 120 miles an hour, which is a hard tumble. We slid on the roll bar top for probably 100. 50 feet or so, and it ground right through on the roll cage. So that's where you see sparks and dirt and everything flying. And the driver got hauled off to the hospital with two broken ribs and a broken collarbone. The race that year was won by another Bronco, one driven by the legendary Rod Hall, a guy that holds pretty much every record there is in 4x4 racing. He's one of the giants of the sport, along with Bill Strop and former Indy 500 champion, Parnelli Jones. I remember one time Parnelli and Strop were ahead of us. This was the 1971 race. They were up on the road, which was like a high-speed built-up highway with no asphalt, just dirt. And the water came through there and washed part of it out about 30 foot wide. And he thought, well, I'll just fly across it and land on the other side where he didn't quite make it. His front wheels caught the edge on the other side and he went end over end and there was not much left of the Bronco when he got done. And... Our buddy James Duff was a little more cautious. I went down into the wash and up the other side and got back up there. You know, asked him if they were okay. He says, oh yeah, we're, we're okay. We're just gathering up all the pieces and they had one headlight left and Strop says, can't get this fool to slow down and Parnelli looked at him. I'll never forget that look. He says, well, it is a race, isn't it? <laughs> Strop and Jones not only fixed their truck, over the next thousand miles, they caught up with the rest of the field and won the race. Now, when you combine the success in off-road racing with the carefree fun of the 60s and the overall free-spinning ways of Americans at the time, you're probably wondering why sales were so, well, relatively speaking, small. The year before the Bronco was introduced, 
um, the market segment had about 40,000 units. Well, that's combining Jeeps and International Scouts, the only options in the segment at the time. Bronco added 23,000 to that total. Those sales in that first year immediately increased the size of that segment by more than 50%. Combine that with the passion and enthusiasm they were seeing from the first owners, and Ford believed they had a winner. So if the Bronco is a winner, who gets the gold star? The marketing person that saw the need? What about the designer that drew that first sketch? Or what about the guy that broke his arm testing in the Arizona desert? Well, all those people put in a lot of work bringing the first Bronco to life. But somewhere, sometime, someone has to say, we need some money to make this happen. And some executive said yes. Well, so who was that? Well, to find out, I went back to our friend, the archivist, Ted Ryan, one last time. Read this out loud. So this, and I've got to set up the date. October, right, it's, 23rd. October, it's October 23rd, 1963, and it's to the members of the Product Planning Committee. And the subject is four-wheel drive vehicles. The purpose of this communication is to review the size and composition of the four-wheel drive vehicle market in the... Zero to 10,000 gross weight range. All right. Outside... Outline possible product actions to improve penetration and profits and request approval of interim funds for further development of a Ford utility vehicle code named Bronco. Okay. It's on blue paper because any communication that was uh, delivered to or from an executive vice president or higher uh, that was official documentation was always done on blue paper. What was the reason for that? Uh, to draw your attention. If you, oh, this if is you, important. <laughs> if you've got an inbox and you see there's a blue sheet in there, you know to go to it immediately. So to an administrative assistant at Ford in the 60s, this blue piece of paper meant they had to jump into action. But me, I'm pretty excited for a different reason. And this is the official document that launched the Bronco program. I mean, it's not the Declaration of Independence, but if you're a Bronco lover, it's like, this is cool stuff. Okay, so the, the names are just for uh, K.W. Cunningham, J.F. McLean Jr., J.J. Neven, C.E. Bosworth, D.N. Fry, Chase Morrissey, and S.M. Vass. Those are the committee members who submitted it for approval. The name I'm interested in is at the bottom of the page. And it's signed, signed by Lee Iacocca on February 7th, 1964. Yep. That's right. Lee Iacocca, the man best remembered for turning around Chrysler in the 80s and filling the streets with minivans and K-cars. At the time, he was a vice president at Ford. And it's his signature on that blue piece of paper that released the funds to launch the Bronco. Now you've got a million dollars and you can go make cars. Go make cars. And that's exactly what they did. They built Broncos and shipped them all around the country. Everything was great for a while. But for the Bronco and for America, dark clouds were gathering on the horizon. In chapter two, we'll go back to Detroit, where the 12th Street uprising was ripping the city apart. And we'll follow a hot air balloon from California to Florida with some unexpected stops in Mexico and Mississippi along the way. It's all in an effort to understand why the Bronco, one of the most popular vehicles ever made, was killed. That's next on Bring Back Bronco, the untold story. I'm Sonarian Glenton. Now be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and wherever you listen. <laughs>